As we prepare now for the message time, we want to go to God in prayer. We especially want to remember a couple of needs here. There are many within our church family. Uh, Mike and Becky Swartz, their, their little baby boy Jonah, uh, is at the hospital. They're running some tests there. He's been having some problems, so just keep them in prayer with that, if you would. Uh, and then also be fa- uh, remembering the family of Washington Newborn, uh, one of our members who passed away overnight last night. So be lifting up uh, his family, Belinda and uh, Corin and the rest of the family there in your prayers. Uh, you may know Washington from uh, he would come to church anytime he possibly could. Uh, that health would allow him to come and he would drive his chair over here. He had one of those uh, uh, kind of like the hover around chair kind of things and he lived in the apartments right across the street over here. He would ride it across Across the, the street here and, and be here at church as much as he possibly could and helped out with a lot of things here. So please, uh, please keep them all in your prayers if you would. I know there are many other needs within our church family. We're so glad that you're here today. Let's uh, lift those needs up together as God's family. Father, we come to you just now in the name of Jesus. We just praise you that uh, even though we say goodbye to someone that was a part of our church family, we know that he had He had made the decision to make Jesus the Lord of his life. He loved Jesus and he claimed the blood of Jesus for the covering of his sins. And because of that, we know that you have a place prepared for him that he is able to go to and be there with you forever. And even though this old earthly body was tired and worn out, he'll never have to face that again. He has a a new existence without any pain or struggle anymore. Father, we lift up those other needs within our church family as well. We know that you have not only the ability to meet the needs, you have the love that compels you to meet those needs so we can have confidence when we come to you in prayer. We know that in that love, you will meet the need in just the right way, in just the right time, and we can can live without fear, without worry, when we learn to trust you the way we need to. Help us to grow in that trust and to have the courage that we need to have to live as you want us to live. As our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. We are doing a study together as a church. If you are new to us today, we are in a study called The Story. Uh, Hence the great big uh, banner up here on the stage and everything. The banners that you saw out in the lobby. Uh, This is a a study that you could be a part of. Even if you're just joining us today for the first time. We have books available in the bookstore for $10 each. If you already have a book, just still think about are there some neighbors or friends or co-workers that you might could share one with. Maybe you could buy an extra one and use this as an outreach connection to take it to them. And and say you might want to read this. This is a great book. uh, It is a collection of scriptures put in chronological order so that you can... Know the whole story of the Bible in chronological order. You can see how it all fits. And what we're doing as we go through the studies, we're looking at the upper story of all of God's working throughout history, but we're also looking at lower stories of individuals, of people's lives, and how they fit into God's upper story. And I hope that as you're going through it, you're making more and more that connection between your lower story in your own life and the upper story of what God is doing in the world and how you are very much a part of God's plan of the story that God is writing. So we want you to participate in this. I I hope that maybe if you are are here and you've got uh, children at home, that you're doing this with your children, reading the story to them, sharing these stories, these chapters, week after week with your children. It's a great way to do this as a family. We even have children's versions of the story, the books available out there as well, if you want to pick one of those up for your children. Speaking of stories, this past week, of course, we remembered... uh, A hard date for our country, didn't we? 9-11 is a tough date. And in the news and uh, and, in a lot of the media, we saw stories of what was going on at that time and how people responded. And I am still just utterly amazed and impressed at some of the stories of the first responders to that crisis. How they rushed in taking no thought of their own lives and what might happen to them. They went to help others. It was amazing the courage that so many people showed. What about the people on that one flight that had realized what was going on? They knew this was a terrorist attack, and they did not want that plane to be used to do any more damage, and they rushed the terrorist on their plane and 
the plane crashed, but, but it only destroyed the lives of the people on that plane. It wasn't used to, to do any more damage. And the courage that it took for those men and women on that plane to say, we're going to do what we can do in this situation. When I read about stories of courage like that, I often question myself, what would I have done in that same situation? We all want to think we're pretty brave. We're pretty courageous. And maybe in our mind, we play out these scenarios of how we would be the hero in the story. But we don't really know, do we, until we face the reality of situations like that, exactly how we would respond. I'm convinced we all want to be men and women of courage. I believe that that's a desire that that God put in us, that we would like to to develop that attribute in our lives so that we could do significant things in this world that really matter. It takes courage to do that, doesn't it? But I'm afraid oftentimes we, we only think about this in terms of major crisis and how we would respond to something like that. When in fact the courage God often calls us to is part of our daily walk. It's part of the everyday, mundane, we think mundane, choices that we have to make throughout the day. He wants us to walk courageously daily. Not just in the moment of crisis. Not just in the moment of terrorist attack or some other tragedy that's going on. He wants us to walk courageously in the day-to-day activities of life. And today we're going to be looking in uh, the story in chapter 7, at an example, a great example of someone who lived courageously for God. But it didn't just start with the story where we pick up with it this week. It started long before that, this courage that this man was showing even as a young man, as a believer in God, as the one who trusted in God. It developed much earlier in his life. And I find that that's true for a lot of people, that courage is something that's developed over time. You're not just born courageous. I don't know anybody that's really just born. I I know people that are born reckless, but not necessarily courageous. There's a difference in being reckless and being courageous. We have our grandson here with us today, Riley. His parents are out of town. They're staying with us. Riley, Riley has this tendency sometimes to be reckless. To try things that maybe he shouldn't try. He sees a ladder when he's a preschooler and he thinks, I should climb that ladder. (laughs) Back when we were in our previous facility and it was, uh, uh, we had a gym type building in there. They'd been working on a scoreboard in the gym that was high up on the wall and they'd been working on it and they went to get some parts and they left the ladder set, set up in there. And all of a sudden his mom runs to get me, Heather runs and gets me and says, Dad, come help quick. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, Riley and Rowan have climbed up the ladder in the gym. And they were all the way up. Riley was on the ledge beside the scoreboard. It must have been 15 feet up on the wall there. And Rowan was right up on the top of the ladder. He, he followed Riley right up there. I know Riley was the ringleader. I have no doubt <laughs> that Riley was the ringleader there. But there have been so many other things where it looks like that's part of his nature. And I was that kind of child, too. I was one of those children that that I wanted, if I saw something that, that I thought had excitement connected to it, I wanted to try it. But that's not the same thing as courage. Courage is, is something that causes us to be willing to do something smart. It's really smart, but it carries great risk to it. It is really, in the long run, the wise thing to do, but it's scary to do it. That requires even more courage than just doing something risky for the sake of being risky. And what we're going to be talking about today as we go through this is how it takes great courage for us to live the lives that God has called us to live daily, day in and day out. You see, it takes courage for someone at the end of a service like this to come forward to be obedient in baptism when they know this what God's word says and they know they need to do it but they're afraid to get up in front of people they're afraid to to uh, how people might respond they're afraid they may even have family members that don't support that decision and, and yet they know God calls them to do it it takes courage to walk down that aisle in front of everybody and make that decision and follow through 
with being baptized into Christ. It takes courage. If you're here today and you're in a relationship that you know God is not pleased with. It's not the relationship that God wants you to have. You're not doing it God's way. It takes courage to say to that girlfriend or that boyfriend, we have to stop this. We have to break this off. Or if you're married and you're involved with someone you shouldn't be involved with, to say, we can't do this anymore. It's wrong. It takes courage to make that decision, to take that action. It takes courage for a husband to go to his wife maybe one night after they've gone to bed and say, I want to confess to you, I know I haven't been the spiritual leader for this home like I need to be. But I'm going to ask you to help me. I want to start doing that. I want to rise up and be that leader for my home that God wants me to be. That takes courage. It takes courage for you to sit down across the table from a friend and say, you know what, I just have to confess to you, I have real problems controlling my temper, and I've been letting it get out of hand my, with my children. Please pray for me and help me with this. It takes courage. It takes courage for an employee to go to the boss and say, you know what, I, I know you're my boss, and I know you have every right to fire me, but I can't be dishonest on the books anymore for this company. I'm not going to do that anymore. It's wrong. I'm not going to cheat, lie, or steal, even though you're the boss telling me to do that. Day-to-day -day decisions. It takes courage for you to sit down with a brother or sister in Christ and say, you know what, I'm struggling with pornography. It's got a grip on me. And my mind is, my mind is being changed and perverted by what I'm watching all the time and seeing all the time. And I want to break away from it. But without those steps of courage, we can never live daily the life that God is calling us to live. We can't. We have to develop that kind of courage. In our culture, it takes a lot of courage. Because the culture would tell you to not do this. It takes a lot of courage to fight for a marriage when you don't feel love in the marriage anymore. It takes a lot of courage to say, I'm willing to stay and fight and not walk away from it. I'm going to do whatever it takes. As far as it's in my control to try to save this marriage and make it what God intends it to be, it takes a lot of courage. And the reason, as Christians, it's going to take more and more courage to live daily the way God's calling us to live it's because more and more of the culture around us is counter to that. It used to be easier to be bold as a Christian in the United States of America because we had the full support of almost everybody around us to do that. It's not that way anymore. And it's getting less and less that way all the time. So if we are going to, in this culture, live daily for Christ, it's going to require more and more courage on our part. I, I'm convinced that we have been kind of deceived into thinking that the church has always had it as good as the church in America has it. But if you read through the Old Testament stories that we're reading through, and if you read through the New Testament and the beginnings of the early church and the early followers of Christ, guess what? The culture they had to stand for God in was every bit as bad and worse than the culture we have to stand for God in. I hear these people all the time say, we got to be in the last days because things are getting progressively worse and worse. Have you read the Bible? It's not getting progressively worse and worse. It's cycling like it always has. There are places in the world where it's gotten better, and then it's gotten worse again. And then in this part of the world, it's gotten better, and then it's got worse again. And it was that way for the Israelites all the way through. It was that way for the early church during their uh, beginnings and the early years of the church. And it's been that way ever since. And it's that way for us today. We're in a cycle that's our culture that we live in is turning away from God. We're not the first culture to do that. It's happened many times. And Christians have had to have enough courage. To stand up and live for Christ in the middle of that. So that's why we're having this lesson today. 
so that we can learn the need for courage and how to develop the courage that we need to have. If you got your Bibles, you can turn to Joshua chapter 1. That's where we're going to start today. Chapter 7 of the story, it talks about Joshua. It tells us a lot about how God worked in his life. We pick up today at a time where Moses, you remember, had led them out of Egypt. He had led them out to uh, their freedom. They had been pursued, but uh, God did miraculous things and stopped Pharaoh's army from being able to get them. And they were now, had gone to Mount Sinai and they had gotten the law. They had spent some time there. Uh, they had started traveling to the promised land, but they did not uh, enter the promised land. In fact, because of their lack of faith and their disobedience, they were having to wander in the wilderness now. And they spent a total with the year at Mount Sinai and the time in the wilderness they had spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. They were being led by God. They had been taught about the tabernacle and the law. So they were, they were moving the tabernacle every time. It was a tent-like structure. And they would set it up where the cloud would stop. They would set up the tabernacle and all their tents. And they would live there as long as the cloud stayed there. And then if the cloud lifted up and moved, they had to break everything down and move to the next place. And God was leading them from place to place throughout the wilderness. And all that time God was providing for them. Remember last week, they were provide, he was providing manna and that wasn't good enough for them. They whined and complained about the manna. He sent meat and, and they, were, uh, they weren't even grateful for that after a while. They were tired of the meat. I mean, no matter what God did, they were griping and complaining the whole time. And God said, because of your lack of faith and your unwillingness to trust me, This older generation of you that had this lack of faith, you're not going to be able to enter the promised land. So everybody over 20, I'm going to let you wander in the wilderness till that generation dies out. We're going to try to create a new generation of people that have faith that can go and take the land. And that's what we pick up with today. Number one on your outline was it's time now to take the land. It's time to take the land. Well, Moses had died, God had said, because of his disobedience, he would not be allowed to to take them on into the land. So now he appointed another leader for them, who was Joshua, who had been Moses' aide. He had been the one assisting Moses, and now Joshua becomes that leader. Now, here's what's interesting. He's going to be this example of courage for us and what he's about to do by leading them into the promised land. But he had already demonstrated that kind of courage even before then. Go back 40 years. Where they were on the precipice of the promised land 40 years ago. That generation. Joshua was a young man at the time. But he was one of the 12 that were picked to be spies to go in and spy out the land before they were going to go in and take it, right? He sent 12 spies in, one representing each tribe. They spent 40 days in the land. They saw everything. They saw, they came back with this report. And and, and they all had part of the same report. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. They brought back some of the fruits from the land. They said, oh, the the, the grapes, the the, the crops here, they're wonderful. It's a beautiful place. It's just got everything already there that we could ever need. But then 10 of them said, oh, but wait. Oh, the cities are large. And they're fortified. They got powerful armies there. And you know what? There are giants living in the land. They had run across some of the people that lived in this land that they were supposed to possess. Who compared to them and their size. He said, they said, we look like grasshoppers compared to them. I like that. Because I used to be told all the time, kid, you just knee high to a grasshopper. You know? Like, I'd be happy they were telling me that, you know. That's not a good thing. You're not going to build up a child that way. And they said, we're, we're like grasshoppers compared to these people. They're huge. And, you know, combat in that day and time, it wasn't like you could send in an airstrike and take them out. It was hand-to-hand combat. That's how they fought their battles. You're talking about great big giants compared to little people fighting hand-to-hand combat. To try to take the land. They thought there's no way we can take this land. But there were two spies. Who said no. We saw the same thing. They saw. But we can take it. In fact it's ours for the taking they said. Because God is going to give it to us. Joshua was one of those two spies. 
It was Joshua and Caleb. This is the same Joshua that now, 40 years later, God is saying, I'm going to use you. You're going to be the leader that takes them into the land, that takes this land for my people. God had seen in Joshua already the beginnings of that faith that produces courage, the kind of courage that he was going to need to have to go in and take the land. So I believe we can learn a lot from Joshua and his example here because he was the one who said we can do it. We can do this not because of who we are, not because of how big we are, not because of how well trained we are, because they were none of those things. We can take this land because God says we can take this land, that it's ours, that he's going to give it to us for our possession. That's why we can have courage. So we need to understand, the very first thing we need to understand is this God is telling you to do something. If he's saying go, take, do, if he's saying give, release, if he's saying stop, we need to understand. He's looking for men and women who have the courage to do exactly what he's saying to do. And if you're not willing to be those people, guess what he's going to do? You're going to miss out and he's going to go to somebody else. He's going to go to another generation. He's going to let them have the blessing. If you're not willing to have the courage to move forward. God's saying it's time to take the land. The question was, were they going to be courageous enough this time? Was this generation going to believe? Was this generation going to trust? Was this generation going to be willing to go up against the same odds that the previous generation was unwilling to go up against? In the name of God. Sometimes we think, oh, the church, our job is tougher now than it's ever been. No, it's not. It's been this tough forever for the church against pagan culture in the world. Are we going to be a generation that's got the courage to take the land? To go in and possess the land that God wants to give us as his people? Are we going to be a generation that says we can't do it? Or are we going to be the generation that says we can, not because of how big and strong and powerful we are, but because God says for us to do it? So Joshua, I believe, he's a man who's already, at this point, he's 40 years older. He's developed even more, I believe, of his faith in God. He's seen God providing this whole time for the 40 years in the wilderness. He's, he's older. He's wiser. But you know, sometimes as we get older, we begin to take less risk, right? I know I do. As I get older, I, there, there are things I used to try without even thinking that now I think a lot before I try <laughs> some of those things, right? Because I know I, I might could still do it, but it would take me three times as long to recover from it, right? <laughs> Even if I was able to do it. Joshua's gotten older, but instead of being less willing to step out and do what God wants him to do, it seems that he's even more willing. He, he's more willing to trust and be obedient to what God is calling him to do. Which leads me to the second thing on your outline, and that is he is about to face something really big. And God's main message to Joshua was be strong and courageous. Let's pick up here in Joshua 1, beginning with verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses 8, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where, you're, where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land. I swore to their ancestors to give them. Verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. 
So God is sending his people a second time to take this land that he had promised Abraham hundreds of years before. And Joshua is now more of a seasoned warrior. He knows this is not going to be easy. He's been in the land. He's seen the cities. He's seen the fortified cities and the walls. He's seen the giants himself with his own eyes. He knows what they're up against. And God tells him four different times in this chapter, be strong and courageous. He knew that more than anybody in that whole crowd, Joshua knew what they were up against. Because he had been there already. He had seen all of this firsthand. He knew the temptation would be to, to overthink this, to start focusing on all those obstacles instead of what God was calling him to do. He understood that that's our human nature. So he reassures them. He, he commands them over and over again, be strong and courageous. Now, They're not there yet. They're not at the city yet. But here's what God's doing. He's preparing Joshua ahead of time. You see, there's been 40 years since he was there. So maybe he's not remembering it exactly right. Maybe it's not so vivid in his mind anymore. And now he's in a different position. He's not a spy coming back to tell the older guys what's going on. Now he's the responsible guy. He's responsible for all of the people as their leader. So he may look at it differently this time. He's about to go in. The city they're going to take first there is Jericho. It's a huge city. Got a big wall around it. They are well fortified. They've got a well trained military force there. And he's thinking, uh, I'm sure uh, God must be thinking that if Joshua gets there and sees that this time, he's thinking, ah, he may rethink this idea because now he's responsible for all those lives there. He's the one that's going to say, let's go to battle against these people. So he's telling them in advance, be strong, Joshua. Be courageous, Joshua, before he sees the wall again, before he sees the enemy, before he's face to face with the obstacle again. He's telling them ahead of time, be strong and courageous. You know, it seems to me more and more clear as I go through this study of the story, how God does that so many times. And how he does it in my life. Hindsight's always better, isn't it? You can look back and see this. How God did things to prepare you for things that were going to happen later. Have you ever been aware of that in your life? How you can see how God used something back in your past that was really getting you ready for something else. I've seen it in my life over and over again. And sometimes it's something like a message that you heard at church one Sunday. And you thought that message really didn't apply to me that much. Until you faced a situation. And all of a sudden that message. Oh yeah. I remember now what God said about this. If I was in this circumstance. If I was facing this something like this. God's preparing you all the time. That's why. As I said last week. Sometimes we're so busy trying to get to the next thing. That we're not focusing on the here and now. Letting God do with us right now. What he's trying to do with us now. A lot of times what he's doing with us now. Is getting us ready for. What's coming. Down the road. That's why it's so important to be consistent in your Christian walk, to be be regularly in God's word, to be regularly in prayer, to be regularly in church together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because you don't know what the future holds, but God does, and God will prepare you, if you let him, for what it is you're going to be facing later on. The question is, will you let him? Will you be responsive? Will you be cooperative in the process so that God can get you ready For what you're going to face. It's no accident that I went through some of the stuff I went through growing up. To prepare me for where I am today. It's no accident that God used something recently in my life. To prepare me to be able to help a family that I was going to need to help. With something very similar. See God prepares us in advance. For those challenges and those opportunities. That we're going to be facing in the future. So he knows that Joshua has been being prepared. And he's trying to encourage him and get him ready ahead of time before he goes out to fight the battle. He's getting him ready to be the one who can do this the way it needs to be done. So he says again and again, be strong and courageous. So when they get there and they see the walls, they realize why God said it so many times, right? Don't you think Joshua got the connection then? When he was leading all those people and he was saw the great wall and he saw that there was a great army there and that they had such an obstacle to try to overcome, Joshua was saying, oh yeah, that's why God was saying, be strong and courageous. 
That's why he was trying to get me to get that into my head, into my heart, into my mind. Because this is huge. This is bigger than me. This is an obstacle that, that without God, I can't do this. So he was preparing him in advance for what he was about to face. You see, when they got to Jericho, Jericho was known. We, uh, we have been able to, archaeologists have been able to excavate a lot of the site where Jericho was. Uh, in the 1950s, they started excavating that site, and they found, guess what they found there? This wall. Jericho had kind of a double wall around it. It had an outer retaining wall, and then it had an inner great big wall around the inner part of the city as well. And guess what they found when they excavated that wall? That that wall had fallen at one point in history. Not only had it fallen, but it fell in a way that it wasn't forced over from the inside. It just collapsed. And it fell down toward the outside on its own. Now they could tell by the scattering of the rocks and the way the rocks fell down off the hill of the, of the retaining wall there, how it collapsed down over that wall. They can see that it was a wall that just collapsed. Isn't that great? I love archaeology, by the way. I dig it. (laughs) But when Joshua saw that wall, there was no way for him to get around it. There was no way for him to get over it. There was no way for him to go through it. I mean, they didn't have the means to do that they didn't they didn't have the equipment they didn't have the weaponry they had nothing that could penetrate that wall nothing and that's why God was preparing him in advance Joshua be strong and courageous because this is something you're not going to be able to do on your own it's going to take some courage for you to even attempt doing what I'm about to tell you to do what I want you to do right now is try to identify in your life right now some wall that you're facing Something that's hard. Something that you know is a real hard challenge for you right now. And maybe you can't identify one right now. That's okay. Get prepared. There will be one. In this world, we're going to have trouble. We're going to have walls. We're going to have obstacles in this world that we live in. They're going to be there. Today, God's trying to prepare you. He's working on you. He wants you to develop faith that will lead to courage, that will lead to obedience in your life when you face those walls that you're facing. Everybody in this room, those that I know well enough to know something about your life, I know some walls that you've faced. I know some obstacles that you've faced. I know some that you're facing right now. And I'm not making light of any of those. They are hard. They are hard. But be strong and courageous. God... God's there preparing you so that you can face these walls and have the victory that he wants you to have. Well, when you get to chapter 6 in the book of Joshua, you can flip on over there. Joshua's been told, be strong and courageous and lead the people out there. And they're getting ready. Can you imagine now, Joshua is the leader. He's the military leader. And Joshua knows about the wall around the city of Jericho. That's the city they're supposed to go in and take now. And he knows about how big it is, how strong it is. He knows he doesn't have any weapons that can penetrate the wall. They've got no way to climb over the wall. They've got no way to sneak in or around the wall. So he's trying to come up with something. Can you imagine? He's the responsible leader for the military action that they're about to take what's his plan I I mean how's he going to do this I'm sure he's trying to strategize every possible way that they could go in and have some chance of victory against this obstacle that they're facing He's trying to figure it out, I'm sure. He, I, I bet in his mind, I, I don't know, we don't have it recorded for us, but, but he's, a, he's a leader. He's, he's a guy that's going to try to formulate a plan for the people to follow so they could have a chance of victory there. So he's probably been working on this plan in his heart and his mind, trying to figure out how to do this. But God says, Joshua, I've got a plan for you. Okay? In chapter 6 and verse 2, the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. Now, that sounds good. Here's the problem. They still haven't fought a battle yet. And the wall is still standing. And the army is still on the other side of the wall. Yet God is saying, see, I've already delivered it into your hands. Now, had I been Joshua, 
I'd be saying, uh, wait a minute, God. <laughs> We're still out here, and the army of Jericho is still over there, and we haven't taken anything yet. And I don't even know how we're going to start. That's what I would have been saying. But Joshua listens to God. And God is saying, I have already delivered Jericho in your hands. He speaks of what has not happened as if it already has happened. That's when you know you've reached a place of courageous faith. When you're willing to speak of something that hasn't happened as if it already has. That's a courageous faith. Now, this is God saying it, but we know that Joshua is believing it because of the response that Joshua gives to God. Joshua is willing to move forward the way God tells him to move forward. So he's got enough courage, he's got enough faith in God that he's willing to accept God's statement, I have already delivered Jericho into your hands. Now, if God has promised something, that's the kind of faith he wants us to have in it. If he's promised it, then we should be able to claim it. Here's the problem, though. We've got pastors today and churches all over America who are doing the name it, claim it game. You know what I'm talking about? Name it and claim it. You name what it is you want, and you claim it. That's not what God's doing with Joshua. That's not what God does anywhere in the Bible. That's never what he instructs us to do. To name it and claim it. That's not scriptural. That's not Christian in any way. If God names it, we need to claim it. That's the difference. What you want may not be at all what God wants for you. It may not be at all what's best for you. Let's stop trying to manipulate and control God. We are not in that position to be able to manipulate and control God. Guys, please hear me out. I'm not trying to to call anybody out here. Yes, I am. uh, I see these posts on Facebook. If you believe God loves you, repost this, and he'll grant you a favor within two minutes. You got to post it within two minutes, and God will do something big for you. He'll, He'll do a favor for you. You actually think you can control God with a Facebook post. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. That you're going to manipulate and control God by doing something like that. Instead, why don't you find out what God wants you to do and do that so you can be blessed by God. Instead of trying to get God to do what you want him to do, you start doing what God wants you to do. And Joshua understood this. He had the right kind of faith. He didn't say, well, God, I just want you to make the walls fall down. I'm claiming it. No, God told Joshua what God was going to do. And Joshua, he then said, here's what you need to do. So that you can have the blessing that I want to give to my people. A courageous faith is speaking of what hasn't happened as if it already has, if God has already spoken it. Not just because we've spoken it and we've tried to claim it. And that leads me to number three on your outline, and that's this. Even when God speaks it, it's still absolutely essential that we follow God's plan for it to happen. Even if God is the one who spoke it, here's what I will do for you. He has a way for you, a plan for you to follow so that he will do that for you. And we still have to follow the plan if we want God to do that for us. How many of you in here would love to be blessed financially by God? Raise your hand. I see almost every hand up. Those of you that didn't raise your hand, stay poor. I don't care. (laughs) Now, I'm not talking about getting rich here. I'm just talking about being blessed financially, okay? A lot of people, I just want God to bless me financially. And and you just think, God, the way you're going to do that is I'll buy lottery tickets. And God, I just want you to help me win the lottery. But God has said, don't go into debt over your head. Don't be a slave to debt. Work hard. Pay your bills. Keep your obligations. Don't make obligations you can't keep. God's already got a plan for how you're going to be blessed financially. Why not follow his plan instead of trying to manipulate and control God? God said, bring me my tithes first above everything else. Why not follow that plan instead of trying to manipulate God? Do it according to the plan. 
God has promised the blessing, but it's connected to the plan. We need to follow God's plan. So he gives them this plan. This is a great plan, isn't it? Listen to it real quick. Joshua 6. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do it for six days. Seven priests carrying trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. The wall of the city will collapse. The army will go up. Everyone straight in. And Joshua must be thinking, what? <laughs> I'm sure as a military leader, none of his plans were, let's put together a band with trumpets. Let's get the priest who don't even know how to fight to lead the way. And let's carry the ark around the wall. And let's just, let's let's conquer the city with a marching band. That would have never been the military plan that Joshua had come up with. But that's exactly the plan that God gives to Joshua. So here's the question. Why would anybody do that? Why would anybody do that? I mean, Joshua has to be thinking. We're either going to make God look amazing or we're going to look like idiots. One of the two is going to happen here. Right? I mean, if we do this and it doesn't work, how's that going to look? That's going to look bad, isn't it? They're going to look ridiculous out there. I mean, they gather all the army together. They get assembled. And I'm sure the army inside Jericho sees them and they're ready. They're prepared for a battle. And all they do is walk around the city one time and go back to camp. They walk around the city one time, play a little music on the trumpets, and go back to camp. That's all they do. The next day, they show up again at daybreak. Here they are again. All right, we're ready for battle. Walk around one time, play a little music, go back to camp. Six days, that's all they do every day. One time a day, going around the city. Seventh day, they thought, all right, we're ready for battle. And they march around the city. And they thought, all right, let's see if they go back to camp. But no, they kept going. And they marched around seven times, like they were told. And they did exactly what God told them to do, exactly the way God said to do it. And they sounded the trumpets and the people cried out a scream of victory in the name of God. And the walls came down and they took the city. I'm convinced that our number one way of dealing with fear is avoidance. We try to find every way in the world to excuse ourselves from doing what we're afraid to do. I think that's our number one response to what we're afraid to do. I'm afraid to do marriage the way God says to do marriage. I'm afraid to do my relationship the way God says to do it. I'm afraid to do my finances the way God says to do it. So we try to find some reason, some loophole where we can justify not doing it the way God says to do it. Right? We all do. We're all pretty skilled at that. God, I understand that's what you say. But in my case, you have to understand. Right? In my situation, it's unique. It's a little different. You can't expect me to do it that way. I mean, I understand why you're telling those people to do it, but but not me. We try to avoid doing it the way God says to do it. But we still want God to bless us, don't we? The only way to get the victory and the blessing is through the obedience to the plan that God gives. Which leads me to the last thing as the praise team comes up, and that's this. Here's why we can have confidence in the plan. Because the plan included a direct promise from God that he will be with you. That God will be with you if you follow my plan. Here's what I think changed for this generation. The previous generation looked at how big the enemy was. This generation focused on how big God was. That's the difference. They stopped looking at how big the enemy was. And they started focusing on how big God is. In Joshua 1, 9, God said, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For, here's the reason you don't have to be afraid. Here's the reason you don't have to be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You don't have to be afraid. God is wanting your story to be about how big he is. Not how big you are. And not how big your enemy is or your obstacles are. He wants your story to be about how big he is for you. In Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, under the new covenant, he says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? I love it. That's the confident faith. 
that God wants to see from his people. No matter what culture it is we're living in, how good or bad the culture is, that doesn't change one bit how big our God is. No matter how big the enemy gets, how much opposition there is, it doesn't change, it doesn't diminish how big God is at all. He's still that big, powerful, amazing, victorious God that he's been throughout all of history. And that's the lesson of the story today. In Romans 8, verse 11, I love this verse. It says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. If the spirit of God is in you, even death itself has not got a chance against you. Every enemy has been destroyed by the spirit of the God who is with you always. If you're ready today to claim the power of the spirit of God living in you, today you could come professing his name, being baptized into Christ. The Bible says he gives you then his spirit to live in you, to dwell in you and never leave you or forsake you. That's the power. That's the victory that should give you your courage. As we stand and sing, we invite you to come.